Hi, everyone. I'm just going to let uh, folks load in and then we'll get started. Thanks for being here. Hi everyone and good evening and welcome to tonight's live online author event with Greenlight Bookstore. I'm Jackie from Greenlight Bookstore and we're thrilled to host tonight's events with Michelle Orange presenting her new book, Pure Flame, A Legacy. She will be talking with Adele Wildman, so you're in for an excellent time. Before we start, I just want to say a huge thanks to Michelle, Adele, and the team at FSG for making this happen and to all of you for showing up. Though we're not able to host events in our store spaces, our community of authors and readers is still here. And we're so grateful for your support and for the chance to make space for your conversation and connection. Now, just a couple of housekeeping things. In our Zoom webinar tonight, you can see and hear the speakers, but they can't see or hear you. They can't see that you're here though. And you can see a count of your fellow attendees on the top of your Zoom screen, the exact location, depending on what kind of device you're using. There are a couple of different ways you can interact with the authors and with each other throughout tonight's event, which we highly encourage. The first is the chat, which you can find by clicking on the icon that looks like a single speech balloon. You're welcome to post your comments and thoughts in the chat. It's a great way to show your appreciation for the author and to interact with fellow attendees. If you have a specific question you'd like to have answered by the author, uh, please post that question in the Q&A module. You can find it by clicking on the icon that looks like two speech balloons in conversation. We'll be pulling questions only from the Q&A tonight to be answered later on in the program. So as you're, as they're having the robust conversation, you're like, oh, I want to ask this. Feel free to type it in. It won't disrupt anything. Um, and then we'll get to them later on in the program. And importantly, tonight's featured book, Pure Flame, is available for sale from Greenlight Bookstore. You can shop in person in our bookstore locations from 12 to 7 every day of the week, and you can purchase Michelle's book as well as many others on site. Or you can order online at Greenlight Bookstore for a quick pickup at the store or for shipping anywhere in the US. I'll drop the link in the chat for those of you who've just joined us. Um, if you are care about supporting the careers of authors like Michelle and the ongoing existence of independent bookstores like Greenlight, buying tonight's featured book is a great way to show your support. So our interviewer tonight is Adele Waldman. She's the author of the novel, The Love Affairs of Nathaniel P, which was named one of 2013's best books by The New Yorker, The Economist, The New Republic, NPR, Slate, Book Forum, The Guardian, and many others. Her writing has also appeared in The New Yorker, The New York Times, The Wall Street Journal, The Washington Post, and a host of other publications. Adele lives in the Hudson Valley with her husband and daughter. She's appeared on Greenlight Store stages in the past, so it's great to have her with us again here tonight on the virtual stage. She will be speaking with our featured author this evening, Michelle Orange. Michelle is the author of the essay collection, This is Running for Your Life, which was named the best book of 2013 by The New Yorker. Her writing has appeared in The New Yorker, Harper's, The New York Times, Slate, Book Forum, The Nation, and many other outlets. A contributing editor and columnist for the Virginia Quarterly Review, she's a faculty mentor in the graduate writing program at Goucher College and an adjunct professor of writing at Columbia University. Michelle's new book, Pure Flame, is a ferocious reckoning with feminism, family, and motherhood, told through a blend of memoir, social history, and cultural crit criticism. The book has been praised by several acclaimed authors, including, uh, including Keith Lehman, Alexander G., Jeannie Manasco, and tonight's interviewer, Adele Waldman, who calls it the best book I've read this year, and adds that Pure Flame is both a pleasure to read and a work of high seriousness. This is a book that expands and breaks your heart not with sentimentality, but with its intelligence and compassion. What a delightful uh, way to introduce um, Michelle and Adele this evening. I'm so excited to hear what they have to say. Um, and I'll uh, see y'all on, on the other side for Q&A. Thanks so much for being here, everyone. I think you're muted and it should let you unmute. Just unmuted myself. Hi, I'm sorry about that. Um, so thank you, Jackie, for that introduction. Um, so I am so excited to be here tonight. I am lucky enough to have known Michelle for, gosh, about 15 years now, Michelle. And I have admired her writing for just as long. I loved her first book, This Is Running For Your Life. And naturally I was very excited when she sent me an advanced copy of this one a few months ago. and. 
all I can say is I was not at all disappointed. Um, of the many things that are really impressive about this book and about Michelle's writing in general, which include her intelligence, her writing, which is stylish, um, the insights that she just tosses off so lightly and, and casually, um, it's such sort of stylish language that um, it kind of takes your breath away to realize how insightful she can be in such a casual and consistent way. Um, but I think of all these things, what really impressed me the most about this book is how fair it is. Um, Michelle is so fair both to her mother and to herself and to all the different incarnations of each of them that existed over the years um, as she traces their relationship. And you know, I think Michelle's talent and intelligence make the book absorbing and um, a great read, but it's this, this moral quality, this respectfulness that Michelle has both for her mother, for her younger self, um, you know, even when the two are at odds and she's just, just respectful of each of them, that I think make the book feel just so uniquely humane and alive. Um, I, um, I just can't, the book is such a loving testament to Michelle's mother in, in total, and yet, it just resists all sentimentality in such a feat. So to me, reading this book, when I was finished, it felt like Michelle had performed a magic trick. And that is one of the reasons I feel very lucky to be here tonight because I get to ask the magician to um, tell me her secrets and she is not allowed to just walk away. So thanks, Michelle. Um, so, but before we get into to her, the, her secrets, I just, for those of you who have not yet read the book, um, I wanna try to give you a sense of what it's like. So my first question for you, Michelle, is could you tell us who is Janice Jerome and um, when did you first learn of this person's existence? Sure, well, first I just wanna say, you know, thank you to Greenlight and thank you Adele. It's, it means so much to me to be able to talk with you it could only be more special if we could obviously do it in person um, back in Brooklyn where we had so many good times. Um, uh, Janice Jerome is the name of a character that was given um, to someone based on my mother and she's at the center of a business case, um, which is sort of like a, a teaching tool used at business schools. Um, and one of her former professors wanted to use my mom's story um, to demonstrate uh, as a sort of a guide for students to spark a conversation about um, fit and management, um, uh, how not to lose employees of value and so on. And so the story of Janice Jerome is the story of my mom who got an MBA late in her thirties, early forties and started working um, and, and kind of immediately hit the glass ceiling at the insurance firm where she worked and discovered that someone, a man had been hired who didn't have an MBA, who wasn't as qualified as she was, but was being paid significantly more than she was. She discovered this, asked for um, parity and was told no. And at some point, not that long after, received a job offer, um, a, a really competitive job offer, but it was in a different city. And so the, the, the story of Janice Jerome basically lays out all these details and then um, pauses and asks the students to consider whether Janice should take the job or not. And then to evaluate Janice according to a bunch of different criteria. And what happened with Janice Jerome um, was that rather than sparking a discussion about fit, it sparked a, 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 a really intense hostility towards Janice. And the professors realized that um, in fact, what they had on their hands was a, was a kind of a gender study rather than a, than a, a fit study or a management study. And so they um, augmented the story and, and added a Jack Jerome who had, whose story was exactly the same in all its particulars, but it was just Jack and they changed the pronouns. And then they would divide up the students into two groups. Some would read Janice's story, some would read Jack's story. And they would all write their responses to it. And then they would convene a couple days later and it would be revealed um, that they were in effect the same person, but their responses were incredibly different. You know, Janice was a cold, sort of self-centered, um, 
you know, ambitious bitch basically. And Jack was, was a guy who should definitely take the job because that's what, you know, what's good for Jack is good for his family. Um, and so several years, oh my God, I see Isabel. <laughs> I love it. And so several years after um, the initial study, the authors of the, of the original study sort of did a follow-up on uh, uh, gender bias and stereotyping. And, and, and uh, I didn't learn about Janice Jerome until I was well into working on this book. Um, my mother and I were texting about something completely, well, not completely unrelated. We were talking about my work life and my um, struggles with um, money and being paid um, for, for what I do. And she just sort of casually mentioned it. Well, you remember Janice Jerome, you know, and, and I, I told you about Janice Jerome, right? And I said, no, you didn't. And we had a sort of brief exchange about it, which is in the book. And she just told me to Google it. And so I did. <laughs> and I found the study online and I bought it. So that was five years ago. When did she realize that her story was going to be made into this pedagogical tool? And how did she feel about it at the time? I think that's a, such a good question because it's so out of character for her. I, I, I think very shortly after it happened is when um, she was asked if she'd be willing to sort of lend her story. And a lot of the details were very disguised. She had three mm -hmm. children instead of two. She lived in Montreal and not London, Ontario, which is where we live. Um, and I think in a way it, she was gratified by it and, and you know, maybe less surprised by the response of the, the initial response of the students than her than the authors of the study but at the same time she turned down every request that she received to actually come in and talk to classes she didn't want to sort of put her face to the to the name um and she certainly had never that i recall uh, mentioned it to me over the years so it's a I don't, her relationship to janice is a really interesting question right and when you read it for the first time how did you feel as someone who's basically in it? Granted, you're one of three children rather than one of two. So I guess that makes you one and a half times as much. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think but, I'm, a, I'm, the, I'm the six year old who was, who was crying because his mommy wasn't around to play anymore. Um, I, you know, I, I don't think I did read it for a couple days after I got it, or I, I just sort of looked at it quickly and I realized like I was going to need to be in the right headspace to go over it. Um, but yeah, reading, when I eventually did read it, it, it uh, you know, as I kind of get into it in the book, it was, it's surreal, you know, because there's so much I, I didn't know about my mom's life at that time and so much the gaps between us, um, you know, she did take the job in another city and for a number of years um, commuted back and forth. It was a two hour commute um, on, on the weekends she would be with us, but um, you know, I felt my mom's absence quite keenly through uh, those years and in my early adulthood. So reading a, a, a version of her, of our story written by a, a, a kind of third party in a, in a sort of jargony, you know, business school kind of way was, yeah, it was um, both sort of thrilling in a way because I got to see my mom, I, I got to see her from this other angle and like it, incredibly disorienting. Right. Um, and I wonder if maybe we could even back up a little bit more to tell the story of how it was your mom became Janice Jerome, um, how she came to be um, in this position in her 30s with two kids at home. Well, my mom, to, to, to go through it fairly quickly, she got a university degree in 1966. She was the first member of her family of on either of either gender to, to do that and um but was engaged the same summer that she graduated and um i think she wanted to teach there were things that she wanted to do but her you know career wasn't like a, a big um motivator in her life i don't think you know um she and my dad um moved around a bit waited five years until they could buy a house and bought a house which was a really big deal for them um, and um, started having kids. And it was after, shortly after I was born that um, I think she realized that, you know, the marriage, the family, the home, um, all of it, she was, she worked part-time through, through a lot of that. She taught ESL and, and, and did some other things, but um, began to fear for her, for her um, 
safety, or not safety, sorry, security, um, her financial security and, and the fear that if, if her marriage were to fall apart that she wouldn't be able to support herself and um, became motivated to go to graduate school. She applied to a law school, she applied to business school. She, she, wanted, um, she wanted to secure for herself, uh, you know, financial independence. And so she eventually enrolled in a business school where, where we lived and, um, you know, it's a couple year degree and started working and, and uh, I think something got sparked in her beyond the like I, I need financial security, I think she could have had that in London, but it was the coming up against this idea that she was only going to be allowed to progress so far. Right, right. Um, I mean, one thing I can definitely relate to in your telling of the story is the conflicted feelings as a as a child in the situation my mother went to grad school when I was in elementary school maybe third grade or so and I hated it because she had been home and then she wasn't and I think she intended to get a PhD and in the end she got a master's degree and she said how I felt was a factor in that and she maybe a big factor. And she said this without, I, I could tell her implication wasn't to make me feel guilty or bad, but of course, in retrospect, it's so interesting to see how, I mean, the child's perspective, um, I mean, I think as, as you do so well in the book is often very different from the perspective you bring in the book of seeing just how unsatisfied your mom might have felt with the, with the options that had seemed like very good options to her at the time of, of um, marriage and children and, and a house that she took excellent care of um, and children she loved. But um, yeah, I, th I think you do a great job in the book of balancing the empathy again with both positions, the, the child's feeling, but also there's this awareness of the larger context. Um, at what point, I mean, it, throughout the book, you document the way your relationship with your mother changed and changed again and changed again. It's sort of always, always moving. And um, I'm sure it didn't always feel like that in real time. I'm sure during it, it, it felt stuck at moments. Um, but one of the things I think is so interesting in the book is that um, it's, I'm going to actually read part of the, your first line because I love it. It's, it's also a good example of um, the kind of insight you just toss off really, really easily, but you you refer to um, what you now think of as the, um, the, um, the texting sessions that became our habit during the period I now think of as both late and early in our relationship. And I love that line, like both late and early. Um, and can you describe a little bit about what you mean by that and how your relationship changed over time? Yeah, it's funny. I mean, I, I, just just listening to you, I, I thought you know some there was a stuck period that lasted decades. Really, it, it was um, uh, so the the late and early. I, I would say probably dates back. I don't know, eight, nine, ten years ago. You know, when we um, she remarried, or when she was sixty, fifty nine or sixty, and um, retired. She she had a, a sort of brilliant career, became a CEO within 10 years of, of starting out um, in the corporate world. Um, uh, but it was when she remarried and, and she kind of stopped working so much that she began to, she just seemed to transform in, in, in my opinion or in my experience. And um, it was then that a very slow process of us kind of circling each other and being able to relate more um, consistently and tenably began to open up. Um, and so, you know, there, we had this early phase of our relationship that was kind of all about texting. And um, it, we, we were able to um, establish a kind of rapport and a line of communication over text that we just hadn't been able to, to do before. And I, I try to I try to illustrate, you know, in the book in, in different ways, um, the sort of disjuncture between us, if it was sort of bodily and spatial and also, um, you know, it seemed like our values didn't align. It seemed, we, we just didn't, we weren't telling each other stories. We weren't relating. And for some reason, the 
texting thing, you know, like smart, we just both gotten smartphones and we're, everyone was just kind of texting at the same time, obviously, but for us, it, it offered this, um, you know, I was thinking about it. I was thinking about, I, I went down a Virginia Woolf rabbit hole recently for something I was working on and I came across this quote where she says, style is a very simple matter. It is all rhythm. And she, she sort of goes on a bit about, um, you know, once you've got the rhythm, you can't use the wrong words. Um, and that sort of reframed for me this question of like why the texting thing was so big for us. And I think it did have some, I, I feel like part of the repair that we had to do had something to do with style. Maybe I think we were both interested in style in different ways, but that maybe overlap, but it was mostly a question of rhythm of like being so out of sync for so long that the, the fact that we were able to establish a rhythm over text. It kind of didn't matter what we said or the words that we used. It was the fact that we were able to like have a pattern, have a rhythm. Um, uh, you know, uh, we could kind of proceed from there and try to, it was a real starting point for sure. Right. And um, yeah, I think some of, for those of you who haven't yet read the books, the, the text exchanges are just incredibly charming. They're light, they're funny, and they're I was gonna say, they feel very real. I think they feel real and in fact they are. Um, and it's interesting, do you think, how much do you think was the medium of texting and how much do you think was also just in your different ways that you both were ready, um, you sort of alluded to that at earlier points in your life, you felt like you're, you and your mother had very different values. In the book, you've become a person who's less interested in judging your mother's values or feeling judged by her than you are just the, the, than the, the narrator is or the, the intelligence behind the book is just understanding um, both of you. To what extent did actually writing the book kind of help you to achieve that? Or did your relationship with your mom change as a result of, of setting out to write about her and of considering what the world looked like from her point of view in a way that had been you know, difficult for you when you were younger because again to just to emphasize for, for those of you who haven't read it that the relationship with your mom hadn't been easy um growing up and maybe we should start there first maybe but maybe before you got into the the early phases of a really wonderful relationship we should talk a little about those the rougher period um or periods mm. that just um well should, should i talk about the um the question of, of whether writing the book changed our relationship what about the relationship um what if we start with the relationship uh, and then talk about how writing changed it so or or if, do you think writing changed it well let me so uh, what, one thing i've been thinking about someone asked me the other day about um there's a line in the book uh, where I write about how when I was younger um, and I was full of questions for my mom, my experience of asking her questions was that she experienced them as a, as a form of interruption. And the person asked me um, to say more about that. Um, and I think that had something to, to do with our relationship or my, my experience of my mom it, it's a it's a way to sum up I guess the, the experience I had of my mom from the time I was fairly young which is that she was sort of focused elsewhere you know and um had her own uh obviously had her own set of decisions and her own objectives and the sense that my my questions were a kind of interruption of, of that process interruption of the story she was telling about the decisions she was making and who they were going to benefit and what they were really about. Um, and it wasn't that I was questioning her decisions. They were just sort of like ordinary. Um, well, even questions about her, her faith, right? Her Catholic faith and, and sp specifically the context is why she stayed behind um, when it was time for communion. And the rest of us would go up and take communion, but my mother would stay behind. And when I asked her why, she just, you know, sort of um, would brush me off. And that was fairly typical. Um, and I also talk about, you know, for me as a writer and as a person, I think, um, inquiry or questions as an act of love. And um, 
part of what I had to do or, or part of what happened over time, you know, the, the breach between us was so large and sort of complicated that um, the process of breaking it down, I think was very slow and it was a matter of um, my sort of interrupting <laughs> or questioning the, my, my own stories that I told about my mom and the decisions that she made. And, and it really did begin so, at some point in my 20s when, when she let me in on certain things about um, the marriage and, 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 and what her decision to go back to school, things that I just had no clue about because she kept a lot so close to the vest. Um, and then her, like I said, her remarriage and this sort of transformation and, and light, very what seemed to me abrupt laying down of her career and those goals. Um, and so the book was really an extension of a process that was had already been in, taking place for many years of, of her being more willing to answer my questions and me being willing to sort of interrupt or question my own, uh, the stories that I told about who she was. Um, I don't know. Yeah, no, and I think it's interesting just to be clear for those who haven't read it that when you talk about sort of a breach between you and your mom because it was in the book you um the impression i got is that you were both always trying maybe intermittently that you'd travel together you this wasn't a a breach of, of um people not like of hostility of people not speaking it was more like attempts to find common ground to find an easy way to be together that didn't just didn't quite work and no one understood why um and i think yeah. that's so interesting because that can be as disturbing as as a more overt type of breach mm -hmm. i think um but i just wanted to put that out there that it's um but yeah we're, this isn't yeah. Um, and so when you, when you first, or, or as the idea sort of grew within you to, to start the, to interrogate your own stories and, um, and eventually when it crystallized into a book project, um, did that play a role, do you think, in, and you say by, you know, by the end of the book, the relationship between you and your mother is just, it's beautiful and so touching and seems, you know, it's just some incredibly um, powerful for both of you. Um, in terms of getting there, do you think that writing the book helped or it's more adopted, like it's documenting a journey that was in place already? Hmm. Yeah, that's a tough question because it, it is, in some sense, it's hard for me to separate, especially once I really did start working on the book. Um, and then her, um, you know, she wasn't ill when I, when I started working on it. And so the decision to keep working on it, I think maybe had, um, or at least not to give up once I, once it became clear that she, her illness was terminal. And then um, certainly after she died um i mean what comes to mind for me is there was definitely there was a period after she entered palliative care where, where we knew you know it was it was kind of the end where i i more or less like stopped writing and i stopped taking notes which i had been doing obsessively before you know like recording scenes and you know just sort of taking in everything i could about her and about that rhythm and our dynamic because it was so interesting to me and i wanted to and she stopped telling stories like she'd also entered this phase um, a little before she became very ill, but especially when she was sick of just opening up in a way that she never had before. And I was sort of taking everything down that I could. Um, so I don't know. I, I think there's definitely a relationship between um, the deepening of our relationship because I had this added imperative to um, you know, see her as she was because I, I knew I was going to um, lose her. But at the same time, um, there, there was this long stretch where it, it, I knew that, um, you know, the most important, like, it, part, part of what the book is about it, it is about her surrender in some sense or her sort of grieving and accepting um, the end of her life and my sort of parallel or intertwined um, surrender of 
of uh, control of the story that I was telling because the story that I thought I, I set out to tell like five years previous, it, it wasn't going to be about my mother's illness and death. You know, that wasn't something I anticipated. Um, and uh, right. yeah, in, in that way, we affected each other very much. Yeah. Um, and I think it's just such a testament to something that I think is so special about the book that that I feel like there are not there are a lot of um, books and authors written about one's actual family that no one would ever ask. Did did writing this book improve your relationships with the people being depicted? Because oftentimes the people being depicted are are unhappy, or the book feels like the author had might have had some um, access to grind or just points they wanted to make in their own defense. And I think it's one of the many things that makes this book so special is it just doesn't read that way. It doesn't, no one is being raked over the coat. Like there's just so much sympathy and understanding for, for um, all involved. And I just find that I, now I'm repeating myself, but I just find that so special and so moving. Um, but this is a good segue into when I say that that could make it sound so so boring. Everybody's just so nice and good and well-meaning all the time. But the book is absolutely not boring. Um, and nor as much as the, the subject is sad because um, Michelle's mother, Jackie, has does get very sick in the course of the book and um, um, and and dies. The, the book is also so full of it, 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 as sad as it is, I think as I as I wrote, I think it, it expands your heart before it breaks it. It's it's sort of a joy to read because it's fun. It's funny. Um, so can we get to the part where I ask you about your tricks? So the process of creating that, of making a book so layered and so full of texture and life. Um, I I know because we've emailed a little bit about it that you um, did did a lot of revising on the book. Can you tell us a little bit about how your first draft differed from the, the book that exists today? Oh man, <laughs> um, yeah, well, like I said, I mean, the, the starting out, the, the, the book was in no way gonna be as personal as it wound up being. I was much more interested. In fact, I remember very clearly having early discussions with you know my agent and editors about like the balance of like the personal and the, and the larger contextual things I wanted to, to bring in to try and um, I guess refract through you know the, the these lives you know that I could account for that were you know my mother's life and, and her mother's life and mine to some extent um, a sense of, of, of how they bore out these these larger cultural political you know social social forces that were at work throughout the 20th and early 21st century so that is to say you know but but you know very within a year or two my mom became quite ill and that um, was consuming and I just sort of continued to forge ahead anyway with this stubborn idea that you know or, or not, not, not sorting through for myself what I was going to do with the circumstances that were were um, just sort of ever-changing um, with my mom's health. And I wound up turning in a draft um, a month before she died. And I suppose the biggest um, difference between that and, and the finished book, um, again, has to do with the, the level of um, personal material in it. Um, it was also, it, it, I suppose it read more like a, ser a series of linked essays. I, I didn't, um, I didn't have a sense of how the structure could work. So the revision process was so much one of um, trying to build in a more coherent through line, all sorts of coherent through lines and movements that would that would carry a sense of urgency and also wrap in all those forces that I was talking about that remains important to me that I. I uh, I didn't set out to write, you know, a memoir necessarily, um, and uh, you know, to go forward with this story of my mother's illness and death, I needed to figure out for myself how to handle that material in a way that I was comfortable with and that I felt served the story that um, I was already trying to tell. Um, and I, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. Oh, I was. Uh, 
um, I think the book does, the finished book, I don't know how I'm dying to, to read the first draft to just be able to compare the two. <laughs> it was so bad. <laughs> you do such a good job of integrating these two threads. So throughout the book, there are meditations on, on all sorts of, of things from um, British suffragettes to, um, to um, a little bit of, of evolutionary biology about how what happens to women who don't want to have children and um i thought that the little vignette and i, I think it so so as a reader of the finished book it seems so seamless it seems like there is a, a roughly somewhat chronological telling of the book um somewhat and then integrated so well with these um sort of larger meditations on 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 all the various and so much that comes up socially and culturally and historically. Um, one thing you had mentioned to me about revising is that you had at a certain point moved a chapter, maybe shifted it four chapters earlier and then things fell into place. And I'm so interested in that because again, you read the finished product and it seems like, oh, of course this was meant to be exactly the way it's written, but it doesn't always um, work that way in the moment when you're trying to get there. Yeah, and it's, that chapter was the first thing that I wrote. Like the, the it was the trip to that we took to Mexico um, to this uh, spa that my that my mom wanted to go to, and um, it was the first thing I wrote in a kind of like you know very preliminary. Maybe this will be in the book, maybe it won't kind of way. Um, and it was before she got sick, obviously. But then it became this thing, and I grew attached to it, and I thought it had a place in the book, but I just didn't know. You know, every draft I'd be like, what do I do with this, <laughs> you know, and it wasn't until I, you know, how, whatever the nth preconception of it when I, I realized I needed to put more of a chronology in, you know, that would really start with my grandmother's death and, and move through my, my mother's death, which is a seven year period. Um, that I needed to move that chapter up and just put it where it chronologically fell, you know, and it was just one of the is a very simple and yet it, it took me so long to 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 do that. Um, yeah, and also, I mean, I, I should say, figuring out for myself um, my own presence in the in the book was not well defined in earlier drafts, and and um, you know, a sort of breakthrough for me was realizing that you know one of the movements that I needed or wanted to to integrate into the book was that of a a, a narrator who was up against you know both a personal and a kind of aesthetic dilemma in terms of how to tell this story and how to do it, you know, like fairly, as you said, but also um, in a way that uh, was in line with, with both, um, I don't know, I, I guess my, my approach as a writer. Um, yeah. I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I think that's, um, seems like such a, a balancing act to, to be to figure out how to be in the book without or to what degree one wants to be in the book and when it's serving the aims of the book versus um something else um no i, th I think that that makes sense to me and again it's the kind of thing when you read the finished product it feels it feels very natural i feel like the i i felt that even as someone who's known you for 15 years i I felt closer to the young Michelle, the teenage Michelle, um, who one might thought like, big feet were the coolest things ever. I've been <laughs> about that so much since. So Michelle liked to, to buy shoes that were too big for her because she just thought big feet were really cool. Um, <laughs> every time I hear like, my feet flapping on the ground, I'm like, yeah, teenage Michelle would have thought that would be awesome. Um, but, but you know, I think I think the presence is it's. Your, your presence in the book is is very, or, or the presence of the younger Michelle is, I, I really enjoyed it. I'm glad it, it made it into the book. Um, one thing you'd also mentioned is that since so much of your writing in the past has been more um, essayistic and that, that writing scenes was a challenge for you. And can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, um, it was something that I think became 
much clearer to me once I knew that I was going to continue with the book um, after my mom uh, was ill and then after she died. Um, and I felt like if I was going to proceed, I was really going to have to push against some of my tendencies slash limitations um, as a writer. And that in, it meant it folding, finding a way to fold in, you know, like you're saying, more, more action, more scene, more, more character, um, you know, things happening in rooms with people in them, you know, that, that I just have been less comfortable um, feeling like I could do uh, in a way that was natural or intuitive. And I needed to find a way to do it that would feel like it was of a piece with everything else I was trying to do. Um, and I, I felt like I needed to do that because part of what I was describing um, once I knew the, the terms of the story, which unfortunately involved my mom's death, um, was about these two people falling back into sync um, and kind of re reversing the, the failures of transmission that I think I try to um, talk about both on a personal level and on a larger level in terms of, um, you know, the feminist movement and, and, and um, its effects on mothers and daughters. Um, and uh, so I, I wanted to, it was important to put the reader in the, in the room with my mother and I to, to, to some extent um, and try and build a, a world that they would want to be in and stay in. Um, and so, yeah, it, it was, you know, thinking back to that question of rhythm, like I, even before I was really intently working on this book, I'd gotten into the habit when I was spending time with my mom of, of just sort of writing down everything that was happening between us, you know, like writing, like, uh, and, and I'm looking back, I think, and most of it, you know, just went into files that never went anywhere. But I think I was trying to like, recapture that rhythm that I was talking about that I was so intrigued by because we'd never, we'd never been comfortable in the same space before. Um, and so just by sort of taking down everything that was happening, everything everyone was saying, um, what the room looked like, what it felt like to be there, um, I think I was sort of just training myself in a way to, to just write a scene. I mean, it sounds so silly, honestly, but it was like, it's just not something that I, it's, which it wasn't part of my toolbox, you know? Um, and so, but I wound up with these like thousands and thousands of words of just different scenes of us. And so it was something that I could go back into once I, I knew I, I had a sense of what the book might actually look like and pull from and, um, you know, put, use the scenes that I thought um, belonged and that could that could um, work on a bunch of different levels. Right. And uh, yeah, like like I said, part of what I wanted to to document when I, when I was talking about um, a writer who is up against both you know a personal situation and and an aesthetic one, it was this idea of like my usual mo as a writer was just not going to cut it. <laughs> you know, with this. Uh, with a situation of, you know, a, a terminally ill parent and then a, a parent's death. And um, I kind of had to seed in a way, um, I, had, I just needed to create more space in the story for just what was happening between us in, in, in rooms together. Right. Wow. Um, yeah, I didn't, I really didn't realize the extent to which the book as you initially conceived it was going to be so much have a different ratio of the more mm -hmm. um, abstract and um, social to, to the personal because it's such an important part of, I mean, it's the backbone of this book. And I think that the, the social commentary is like, it, it adds so much because it puts, it puts the personal in this context um, without sort of narrowly forcing it in there that you're, you, that, that throughout the book, um, Michelle and her mother have a conversation, of course, over text often about whether um, Jackie, Michelle's mother, considers herself a, a feminist. And, and it's fun and funny and it's this recurring theme. And like, it's, it's kind of handled lightly that there's no point really where Michelle, the writer, opines about what the right answer is. There's some times where Michelle, the daughter who's texting with her mom might have her opinion, but the book, like I think it just sort of asks the questions of what does this mean? Why does it mean such different things to different women? Why does a woman who looks in retrospect like like she should be a poster child for feminism because she of, of, 
bucking social pressures in the 80s and becoming as successful as she was in a male dominated field against a lot of odds and fighting for pay equality. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's so interesting, um, her relationship to the term. And I, I think that, but I love how there is a, a lightness of touch of, um, did, did you feel, when you conceived the book, did you have a particular thesis that wasn't, that did or didn't bear out? Or did you come in more with a sense of you just wanted to examine all these different sort of the, the social, um, the social movements in their relationship, but without a particular, like, and this is how they affected my grandmother, my mother, and myself. Yeah, I mean, what I definitely didn't have was an ending um, when I had <laughs> the original idea for the book, but it, it really was interested in um, that, there's just the question of maternal legacy, what it meant, how that question has been, um, like, pressurized and re- uh, reconstructed by, um, you know, a century of, of feminist progress. I was interested in looking at those failures of transmission, you know, why, why certain things haven't been um, carried through generationally. Um, I was partly interested in the, in the suffrage movement um, because it seems like it was such a, a mother-daughter affair to, to it, you know, or, or certainly you could, you could look at it that way. Um, uh, and yet from that point on, I mean, Susan Faludi has written about this, that um, it, the, the, the story of feminism being a, a story of, you know, the, the legacy of no legacy. I was interested in that. And I, I, felt, I felt it in my own life, you know, through, through all the, the complications of my mother's life and what I felt was and wasn't passed down to me. And then looking at her mother, that seemed like a, they experienced a similar version of the same uh, or a different version of the same thing. Um, and so I thought that would be an entry point into these larger um, questions of, of um, severance, you know, particularly my, my mother's cohort. I mean, she didn't identify as a feminist, but the, you know, the second wave, the idea of um, progress as being a, a severing with the past, you know, leaving your, your giving birth to yourself, leaving, leaving your mother behind, you know, um, uh, and what that has meant for women. And, and what I really wanted to do, pulling out all of these con con um, other artists, other writers, you know, historical, social contexts, um, which is kind of look at the sort of halting and contradictory way that um, social change and social progress actually gets lived out, you know, um, through individual lives, but also culturally and, and um, historically. Right. And I think that, you know, really comes across that oftentimes we're learning about the your grandmother's life, and she's living. Um, she was her, she and her husband, your grandfather, were kind of on the cusp of middle class. Maybe they they that was their goal was to be middle class, but really they only lived in a freestanding house for several years, and then moved back into apartments. and And that was how their life was structured. They were living um, in different places around uh, Ontario, I believe, right? and. And then meanwhile, you also discuss sort of what was going on elsewhere in the world. These, the, the, like Simone de Beauvoir writing in um, uh, the, the Second Sex being published in English and its response in New York and the Partisan Review. And it's, I, there's something really magical, I think, about putting these things together because they're not, it's not news to anyone that, that a lot is going on at any one time, but because each piece is very well done, it's 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 just it doesn't feel like one is just stuck on um, kind of after the fact. So I, I'd like to have a sense of the context in which your grandmother's life is playing out, uh, sort of set up against a wider world. Is I think that to me works very well. And again, it's it's one of those things. I, I guess I'm saying, what is this, a successful revision because it looks so um, seamless in retrospect. Um, one of the things I like to say I thought when reading your grandmother's story, and maybe I'm often just, this is the point of view I bring to it, and I think you're much more restrained and not always trying to answer questions, um, is that your grandmother had suffered bouts of debilitating depression throughout her life, and maybe because I was reading about that in this context, I just couldn't help but wondering how much of that had to do with not 
working of having all this pent up energy and intellectual energy that that there was just no outlet for is something I've sometimes just thought of with about to what extent how that's played out in terms of women's mental health over time. I mean, I maybe just because I think if, I think I would go crazy if I didn't have such an outlet and. Um, yeah, I, I think my grandmother's story um, is, is not unique at all, you know, especially for, for women of her generation. Now my grandmother did suffer from, from serious depression and, and um, that is fairly unique, but um, I think she was someone who, uh, you know, came from, from a, a, a sort of a tough background. You know, her, her father disappeared early on. She, she had to stop going to school when she was 14 to start working and, and help out with um, her family. But I also think she loved working and it wasn't until she got married and, and kind of had to stop working and had kids and was um, taken away from her family that these depressions really started. And so, yeah, the connection, you know, again, it's like, you, and, and I sort of, I try to push against this in the book too, because I don't want to, I, I can't be certain and, and we don't know and nothing is simple, right? But, but, you know, I mean, Gloria Steinem has written about her mother in a similar way. I think she called it like a soul um, soul sickness or something, you know, it's just the, the generation of women and, you know, hardly alone, um, alone generation, but those women who, um, weren't really given a, a choice or a chance to get out into the world. And, and then the interesting thing, you know, happens with, with our mother's generations who, who did have more opportunities, like, um, uh, and it's all relative, obviously, but, um, they could do more than their mothers could. They could enter the world in the way that their mothers could not. And that creates a, a, a tension. Um, um, but yeah, I mean, it's, my, my grandmother sort of blossomed after her husband died, <laughs> you know, it's, uh, and was able to, to live a much more independent and happy life. Now she had a, she went into a, a serious depression again at the very end of her life, but there was a good 25 years in there where she had a kind of renaissance that was, you know. Right. Yeah. Um, no, and I, I think that that um, the weaving of the the larger trends and the personal is very effective in that way because you know it's it's it was um, without the answers being pushed on the reader, the questions sort of come naturally to the to the surface. Um, you know, so I feel like we, yeah, the, the story of your mother and your grandmother seem that they're, they're told organically on their own terms, um, but it's hard not to ask the questions um, in that context. How, what, what were, I mean, the, the range of, of writers you discussed, the uh, wide range, um, what do you think you were drawn to in, in um, in the the thinkers and writers you can drew on more in the book, is there any common theme? And could talk about who some of them were. Yeah, I think I was I was most interested in the in the ways that their work and their lives um, bore out uh, some of the questions that interested me. You know about this. Um, you know, the, the question of, of severance, the question of silence, of not, you know, some, like, I think someone like Sontag, who's, whose journal is really filled with ruminations and, and, and um, stories about her mother, but whose work almost completely um, um, effaced her, her mother. Um, and it's not that, it's not to say that, you know, one needs to be um, connected to the other, but it interested me, you know, this idea of, of female writers, especially in the 20th century, um, what that must have been like for them, not having a, not having a, a huge, um, not coming up within a, within a narrative framework where um, one's mother is allowed to be in it. Like, like I think of the, the Town Bloody Hall documentary and the, the, which I sort of returned to throughout the book and all of the women there, like Elizabeth Hardwick, Sontag, Adrian Rich, Jermaine Greer, 
Um, and this question that gets raised that Jermaine Greer kind of like brushes off, which is, um, you know, if you're not to, um, if you're not to sort of grow in the image of your mother, um, by what are you supposed to grow? And I think that really was a question of that moment. And um, again, I think in, in, the, in the second wave moment, especially it was this idea of, of like, no, you sever with the past. That's how you move forward. Um, and so I was, I was just particularly interested to see how um, in their work and even in their self mythologies, the way that they either engaged or really refused to engage with the question of the influence of their mothers on their lives and what it meant to, to leave their mothers, many of whom, you know, who, who might have been raised in the first half of the 20th century who had incredibly different lives and, and, and an incredible lack of opportunity. Um, and where were those stories? Now, some of them were like Adrian Rich and, you know, Jama writers like Jamaica Kin Kincaid. I mean, that story was being told here and there, right? But mm -hmm. I was interested in the ways that it kept getting sublimated or sort of rejected or, um, because I've, 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 I've experienced that in my own writing life. I mean, part of why I was thinking about the question of like, why did you want to write this book? Um, you know, I, I was sort of, I was interested I was interested in the in the disjuncture between my mother and I, but I was also interested in why I had such a lack of interest in it <laughs> for so long. You know, like there is, I'm a, you know as someone who's always been um, and always written about you know uh, forms of connection and disconnection. I mean, this is one of the biggest ones in my life, but I, I had no interest in thinking about it or writing about it for most of my life. And I, I wanted to better understand why that would be this so and have it feel out this sense that like maybe there were forces conspiring to ensure that I didn't, you know, like pay any attention to it. And, and maybe many women writers or artists have, have been subject to those same forces. And, and I wanted to, you know, interrogate that. Right. Well, that's fascinating that like the, that the lack of interest is, is telling as interest and how it speaks to right forces outside of us. I think that's that's just what a compelling insight as, and it's such an interesting insight as something that would spur a project like this. And, and yet it's also chilling because when one reads this book to think that it could have not gotten written because you were, forces had conspired to make it feel like it wasn't a valid or interesting subject. It's, yeah. it's such a chilling thought. Um, Uh, Our Q and A is empty, dude. <laughs> yeah, and no. what's wrong with you people? <laughs> I have so many questions. About the question. I know. I don't. I don't know why they're. Um, I would love uh, to hear about the kind of work you had to do to to get into the space where, um, where you where you ask those questions. Um, I feel like. Uh, like, did it do when you were first having the texting back and forth? I mean, I'm asking this question as someone who has not yet read the book um, and is now very, very sad I haven't read the book yet to ask you a question about it. But um, what did you do to get into the space where, like, that was a m more normal conversation? Did it have to do with your mom getting older? Did it have to do with you getting older? Um, did it have to do with, like, questions of, of motherhood or your interest, in, like, your interest or lack of interest in motherhood? I don't know if that's a, no, that's yeah, a yeah. like the reductionist from what you guys were discussing, but um, no, I'm curious as someone who has not gotten to read the book yet. It was certainly all of those things, and I, I think it, it um, the the questioning to go back to the texting and, and the rhythm, um, it, it it fostered a, a sort of boldness in me, or, or, or uh, and a willingness in my mom to just sort of. Um, it's almost like it was disguised in the form of banter and I could start sneaking in, <laughs> you know, questions about feminism and her feminist identity and her, or, or lack of it and, and, you know, certain decisions that she made. And there were certain things that we never touched um, for sure, but um, I, I was just more willing to, um, to go there with her. And, and really from there, I mean, part of what the book documents is, um, you know, to go back to that question of like questioning is interrupting. Uh, I sort of eventually had to confront and it really wasn't, it was more in the process of writing, of doing the writing that, you know, all the, all the things that I was 
prodding her about and writing her about in terms of her relationship to feminism and feminist identity was just sort of a disguise of the deeper question of, of, of uh, you know, like, what, what, what are your values? You know, who, who are you? You know, what, where, where have you been all my life? You know, to, um, to, to some extent, um, you know, questions that you can't really ask, uh, <laughs> or at least I couldn't. So, you know, you, you just kind of find, find these other inroads into them. That, that insight that to your mother, the questions felt like interruptions, whereas to you, they felt like a, just the most sincere and earnest desire to know her. How did you come by that? Was it something that came from you over time or did, did she tell you this? Like, this is, it seems like one of those simple insights that can transform a relationship, but they're so difficult to, to get to. Yeah, that's one that really didn't come through until the actual writing. Um, and I, I remember very vividly landing on that word, interruption, and I was so like, <laughs> you know, when you finally find the word, and you know, you can stop, like, <laughs> sort of like rummaging through the rest. And I like, I was so proud of it that I'm like, it was in italics for like seven drafts. And then I finally had to just be like, just relax with the italics. <laughs> but it was the, it was in the writing that I think I came to that. Well, that's interesting. Um, so we have a question, which is, um, could you talk about how you, this is a craft question, um, can you talk about how you landed on the reflective present or voice? Um, reflective present or voice. I mean, I, I think that really was a matter of, um, you know, sort of touched on earlier, um, coming to the realization that both that I needed to be more present in the story and that the way I was most comfortable doing that was weaving in a, a, a level of transparency um, mm -hmm. about the difficulty I was having in trying to tell this story and the questioning of myself that I um, needed to make a sort of a source of consistent um, tension throughout the book. Um, so it was late in the process and it, it was really, it really came, um, the first chapter was one that I wrestled with the most and it was always the one that I left until last. Um, and when I, when I felt like I landed on, um, what I needed to do in the first chapter, it really was a matter of like, of building in a more stable sense of perspective and who this narrator was and what their predicament was. And I just didn't have that for, for so long. And, and that was why a big part of why the book was such a struggle. It's so interesting how sometimes an element that seems so central to it could be one that <laughs> emerges only later and only after much trial and error. Yeah. Uh, I find this reassuring. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, because when I look at the book, I think of some of the parts that I found most moving and they, they involve that interplay between you and your mother and things that um, it's, it's the texts, but it's some of the, the conversations later as she became sicker and sicker and to think um, it, it's, and it's, it's so much about the relationship and about what it meant to both of you and to, um, yeah, so I feel like it's, it's your role in the book is so central, even if you saw yourself as a supporting character, it's that interplay. Yeah, I mean, I definitely wanted to, I, I was more comfortable being a kind of conduit more so than a, than a character, but I knew I had to show up for sure. I'm glad you did. <laughs> are, we, are we out of, are we out of time, Jackie? <laughs> um, just about. I was gonna. Uh, there's one more question uh, okay. that I wanted to, I wanted to pose to you, and then we'll call that the question, last question question of the evening. Thanks, folks, for participating, and Michelle and Adele, thank you so much for being so robust. So, a completely complicated question for the last question because it isn't always like that. Um, Carlin asks, "How do you reconcile the fact that your mother seemed to get so much vitality from working in success uh, with the happiness she seemed to have in her post-retirement period, the time when you grew closer to her?" So like, you know, a really, a really mild, easy question to, to wrap up the evening. Um, how do I, I, I don't reconcile, like that's the thing. There's no, there's no sort of like easy reconciling of that. 
it was the most, and, and if you ask, it kind of would depend on the day that you asked my mom, you know, about her, her, uh, her balance of those two things. Um, you know, there's, there's a point in the book at which she sort of says to me very matter of factly that, you know, true love is everything. Um, uh, and <laughs> I couldn't have been more taken aback by that because it just wasn't, that, that was not what I thought my, my mother's value was. Uh, and you just realize over and over again that you don't know a person and maybe they don't know them, themselves and that both things can be true, that, that um, you know, that finding that balance is, is the work of a, of a lifetime. I, I, I know that work was, was desperately important to her, um, but that was, you know, the, the circumstances made it so. Um, and I know that, you know, love in her marriage, you know, later in life was, was uh, the most vital uh, part of her life. And she still worked. She just didn't work as hard as she did. Um, Thank you both so much for such an enriching conversation. I always have to like take a deep breath at, at, at trying to close, wrap up things that don't really have wrapping up to be done. Um, I just, uh, some more things in the chat are coming in. Um, I just put the bio link back in the chat. Um, Michelle's uh, new book, Pure Flame, is available for sale at Greenlight. We have been so, so honored to host this conversation between Adele Waldman and uh, Michelle Orange, uh, focusing on Pure Flame. Um, hope to see you soon in the store. Um, and you know that you uh, have a good rest of your week. We'll see you next time for another event. Um, and thank you both so much for joining us this evening. Have a nice night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.